Linear interpolation is a very important technique I use all the time. Only in my self-driving car course I've used it to evenly space lanes on the road, to evenly spread the sensor rays, and to mutate an existing road network. But I feel I haven't explained it properly, so this video is gonna be about that. And I won't just give you the formula, instead we'll figure it out by ourselves. I think it will stick better like that. And once the formula is clear, I'll show you how to use it to animate movement, color, and sound. You're gonna love this, I'm sure. Now get ready to fill any gaps you might have about this topic. Get it? Fill in the gaps? Because interpolation generates in between ba- No, 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 no! Gonna code, debug and have fun. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Gonna prototype and design. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Let's code now. We begin with basic HTML. In the head, I will define the title, linear interpolation. This video is going to be pretty much like the segment intersection video I made earlier. So if you like this one, you might want to check that one out as well. And in the body, I'm just going to define our canvas and uh, I will call it my canvas, close the body and the HTML page. So now if I refresh here, we just get the title appearing here in the browser tab, but nothing else is visible really. If you go to the elements here in the developer tools, you can see that the body has a canvas element here inside. And uh, there is a margin around this canvas element. We could remove that by defining a style here like this, setting the body margin to zero. And now when we refresh the page, we get here the canvas without the margin there. Now the JavaScript I'm just going to write here after the canvas element inside of the body tag. And um, let me write a script tag like this. And the JavaScript I'm going to write inside the script tag, but I'm going to align it like this in this ugly way, because I don't want to import any JavaScript files for this demonstration. So I'm going to stretch this canvas so that the width and the height is going to equal that of the window. I want it to be full screen like this. And if I refresh, now we see the canvas covering the full screen, but we also see these scroll bars appearing right here, which is something that I don't want. So I'm going to remove that by setting here in the body style, the overflow to hidden and the scroll bars disappear. But uh, I have to copy this, of course, in the style right here. Otherwise, it won't have an effect when I refresh the page. Now, with our canvas set up, I'm going to focus on the JavaScript code. So let's define a point A at 100, 200, and B at 400, 200. So they are the same on the y-axis, but uh, different x values. And let's learn how to draw one of these points. I'm going to access the canvas context like this and uh, begin a path. I'm going to fill this with white. I'm going to draw a white circle there and the stroke is going to be black. So a circle with white fill and black uh, outline. And I will use the arc method of the canvas context to draw it at x, y of um, the a value from here with a radius of 10. So I just want the hard-coded radius value right here. And let's fill this arc and stroke this arc like this, refresh, and we see a small circle there where a is supposed to be. I want to know this is A, so I'm going to set the fill style here to black and I'm going to fill text 
with a label of A at AX and AY. So I'm styling my point a little bit, but it's uh, kind of ugly. So I'm going to go back here and align the text to center, vertically align to middle, and I will make the font a little bit bigger. I'll make it bold, 10 pixels, and Arial font. And now I'm happy with this. But of course, I'm not going to do the same thing for B again. So I'm going to extract this as a function. I will call this, for example, draw dot at a given position with a given label. I'm going to indent this code a little bit like so and replace this A everywhere with this position parameter. And the label here is going to be label, the second parameter from here. So now to get the same effect as before, I draw dot with A as the parameter, but I can also draw B and I'm forgetting the labels here. So if I refresh, I get A and B this time. I actually want this context here as a global variable. So I'm going to move it up here instead. And the next thing I want to do is a simple task. I just want to find the middle of AB, draw a point in between AB. And many students I have know how to do this already. It's often that they do this. They define a point C where X is going to be the middle, like AX plus BX divided by two, and Y is going to be 200 because it's gonna be the same vertical value. And then they draw dot with C and the label C like this, refresh, and there it is, point C. This is fine. It's no problem with this really, but what happens is it's very difficult if I ask them to draw this point C somewhere else, like for example, a third of the way from A to B, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. And students typically try things like maybe replace this two here with three and see what happens. But then this isn't actually a third of the way, it should be more to the right. So something is wrong. With a little bit of playing, they soon figure out something like this, two times dx of a plus b divided by three. But this function that we have here is quite counterintuitive, I think. So let's go back a bit to the middle and have here ax plus bx divided by two and think what we are actually doing. Because this here, ax, and this here, bx, when you add them together, you have this part added twice. So then you divide by two and you get only once that value. And then the difference here from a to b, you get half of that as well. So actually we're doing some redundant things here, adding that value twice. And in the other formula, we are actually adding that value three times. So that's why we need to divide it here three times as well. And then the difference a to b, which is just there once, it's divided by three and we get the third of the value. So how about removing the redundancy and just writing here a dot x plus the difference b dot x minus a dot x times one over three. Refresh the page and C is now exactly where we want it to be. But this equation here is much cleaner because we are telling it to be a third of the way. We don't have two numbers there which are a little bit confusing how did they end up there. And this is linear interpolation. This is the linear interpolation equation. It's called linear because if I'm going to replace this with a random value like so, and refresh this multiple times, you will see that the C points that are going to be randomly appearing there appear on a line. Now interpolation is 
Well, it just means between, inter is like between and I guess poles or something like that. I'm not sure. But you get values in between A and B on a line. And you should already be familiar with this if you've generated random numbers in between some values like here 100, 400. So this is very common what you see right here. But what I recommend you do is if you're going to need to use linear interpolation a lot, extract it as its own function like this. I'm going to call it lerp from linear interpolation and say here a, b and t. And I just return the same equation I wrote at the top and replace here the equation with lerp a of x b of x and t a value that I will define as a constant right here. So now this code is much clearer right here. It says that we want a value between a and b this far away from a relative to a b. And you can write this simpler like this of course if you want to be 10% away from A, 20% away from A. You can even use negative values here. So negative values actually do something called extrapolation because it's outside of these two poles. And values above 1, like for example 1.2, are going to do extrapolation on the other side. Now, if we play around with this formula, multiply each of these with t and then factor a, we get a different version of the same thing. But even if they're essentially the same thing, when implemented on a computer, they sometimes give different results because of how floating point operations work internally. Here, for example, we should really get the same as b since t is 1, but it only works properly for version 2, where a simply cancels out. The subtraction here causes the problem. I usually don't care about this and stick to version 1, as we will in the rest of this video. But you should know about it, because sometimes weird behavior can be explained like that. Now, you can use interpolation for many things, and one thing that I've used it a lot for is get equally spaced things. Like here, I'm going to draw 10 points that are equally spaced relative to A and B. So let's align this here and refresh the page and you get all these points between A, B. The first one and the last one actually overlap A, B. So if I would move this drawing of A and B afterwards, you can see that A and B are now overlapping that point with the label of C there. But yeah, I've used this in the self-driving car course many times, like when defining the road and drawing vertical lines that are equally spaced to each other. Let me make these things a little bit clearer, replace this label here with a dot and concatenate actually the value of I here. So I'm writing here the floating point values of um, of t. So I know that this is 10% away from a, 20% away from a, and so on. And next I'm going to show you how to use this linear interpolation in two dimensions. So for that, let's change this y value of a and b slightly. I'm going to put a to say 300 uh, on the y-axis and b on 100 on the y-axis. And if I'm going to refresh this, we will just see those in-between points, but they don't take into consideration the y value just yet. And to do that, it's actually really simple. We copy this, but for the y instead. And we make sure that we use this same t value in both of these functions. So if I refresh, I get now evenly spaced points in between a and b. And this is true because if you think about this point here, for example, 30% uh, away from A, 
Well, we already know that it is 30% away from A on the x-axis. We have that from earlier. And if you look at these triangles right here, they're actually similar because they're both right angle triangles that share this common angle. So that means that all of their side lengths are proportional. So if this one here is 30% of this one, then this one here must be 30% of this one as well. Now, when you need to use this interpolation in higher dimensions, it's common to write a function for it as well. I'm going to start to write it here. I'll call it vlerp. It's a common notation I've seen in different packages. It stands for vector. Typically, those packages contain a lot of other uh, linear algebra things in them. So vector is a better word than point, but it doesn't really matter for our demo now. And here we are giving two points. And I'll just stick to two dimensions for now and write here x and call here the linear interpolation function we have below for x and y. And now I can go up here and just say that I want the vlerp between a and b using t. And the syntax is just much cleaner and the end result is just the same. Now, one other thing I use interpolation for is animation. I'm going to go up here and say animate. And our animate function is going to start by clearing the canvas. So I'm going to clear the canvas from the top left coordinate of 0, 0, the bottom right coordinate of the canvas width and canvas height. Let me move these points up here. I don't need them defined there. And here I want to define this T a different way. I'm going to show you a trick. We won't need this T and this I and this for loop because we're going to be moving this point in between A and B using some value of T. And since we don't have the I here, I think I'm just going to remove this label entirely. I'll just set it to an empty string. So it's going to be a white dot. And for the value of T, I'm going to use the date object in JavaScript. So I'm going to write here seconds. So I'm going to take the seconds from a new date, which is going to give me the date from now, including not just the day, but also the hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds. And get time will give me actually the number of milliseconds that have passed since 1970. And to get the seconds, I'm just going to divide that by 1000 here. And I will log this in the console so that you know what I'm talking about. Now, I'll set t to actually equal the number of milliseconds from the last second, if it makes any sense. You can think about this uh, math formula that I wrote here. But uh, let me just wrap this up and say here, request animation frame animate so that we call this animate function again and again uh, many times per second. Now, if I'm going to refresh this, you see this point moving between A and B. We seem to not have here A and B anymore. Let me just add it on each frame. So we see it again. And now we see C moving between A and B somehow. And if we open up the console, you can see this number I mentioned previously. So these are now the number of mm, milliseconds, if you ignore this decimal point, since 1970. And this is already after I divide by 1000. So this value right here that is changing every second, this is now the number of seconds since 1970. So if I'm going to take this number with the floating point part and subtract the floor of this number, so this number without the floating point part, then I'm just going to get these floating point numbers from here. And they are going from 0 to 1. 
from basically zero to 0.9999. That's our T value. So it's going from zero to one, from zero to one, from zero to one every second. And it's a nice trick that I think you should know. Now, when animating movement like this, it's often nice to add some kind of easing. And you can have a look at this website that I found. It has a lot of nice functions that are given to you to use however you want. So each one of these functions, if you click on them, you get some kind of tutorial here, how to do it in CSS or how to do it in JavaScript or actually TypeScript here, but they are quite similar. What's important is the actual mathematical function that goes right, right here. Like this one is using the cosine. But yeah, I'll leave you this website in the description. And another website that I recommend using is this Desmos calculator. Now, I want to come up with a function that smoothly goes from zero to one and back to zero and back to one. And the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of that is the sine function. I can plot that here, the sine of x, as x is changing. And I can also zoom in here a little bit and see that it actually goes from minus 1 to 1. And then back to minus 1 and 1. But I want it to go from 0 to 1. So a simple way to fix this is to add 1 to this function. And now you can see it's going from 0 to 2, actually. But that's no problem anymore. I just divide here by 2. So now I have a function that goes from 0 to 1, back to 0, back to 1. Exactly what I wanted. Let's go back to our animation right here and try to input this function here as well. And I'm not going to put it directly in here. I'm going to go through the same process I showed you previously just to see the effect. So if I'm going to write here math.sign of this second value and refresh the page, you see this point smoothly animated, but it's not between A and B because the sign, as you saw before, is between minus 1 and 1. So it's extrapolating here on the other side of A, with A as the center point, so to speak. So what we did to that is we added a 1 here. But if we refresh now, then B is the center point, And we are getting values between 0 and 2, as we saw earlier. So if we divide this by 2, like this, and refresh, we are going to get a smooth transition between A and B. But you may wonder, how long does it take to do this? transition because before we had one animation from A to B per second. And we can figure that out using this Desmos calculator as well. So here you can see that it starts off at minus pi divided by 2. That's when the value is 0. And then it goes to 3 pi divided by 2. So basically, it takes 2 pi seconds to get back to the starting point. And if we want this to take 2 seconds, then we are going to multiply here with math.pi like this. And now every move from A to B is 1 second, and then back to A another 1 second. So if you're interested in getting a timed animation like this, this is the type of manipulation you have to do inside of the sine function. Now, this is still linear interpolation. We are still defining a line, but the parameter that we give to this function is not evenly spaced. Like, if I'm going to go here and comment out this clear rect for a bit, you're going to see how these points are more closely packed closer to A and B, but then more spread out in the middle. And that's what this sine function is doing.
If you want to learn about quadratic interpolation, I really recommend this video. Freya does a great job visualizing the concepts. But in this video, I'm going to show you more applications of linear interpolation. So let's try to interpolate color next. And I'm going to define here two colors as global variables with uh, orange, different red and green, no blue, and a blue with no red, but I'm going to give it a greenish tint and, of course, a lot of blue. Now, here, I want to change the color of our canvas, actually, the background of our canvas. So I will just take out the red, green and blue values of this orange color, like this, using the destructuring assignment. And then I'm going to set the background color of the style of the whole canvas to be equal to and here I'm using template literals and I write an RGB color format like this. Refresh the page and now the canvas is set to orange. If you don't understand how color works, I have a video on that where we look through pixels through a microscope. Check it out if curious. But now it would be really, really nice to change this orange into the blue color I defined earlier. And it would be great if I could just write here something like vlerp, the function that we had previously for higher dimensional data, orange, blue, and our t value. The problem with this is that our red, green, and blue are not our x and y values, so this function as such won't work. But we can make it general if we just iterate through all the attributes. Like this. I'm going to remove that part and say here that the result that we plan to return, it's an object, an empty object for now, and then I will go through all the attributes in A, for example, I assume these A and B are the same kind of objects. And then I set the attribute of the result to the linear interpolation between that attribute of A, that attribute of B, and T. It's essentially the same function as before, but I generalized it to work not just with points, I mean X and Y attributes, but also with these other points that have R, G, and B values. So color can be seen as a three-dimensional point as well. And that's what I'm doing here. Now, saving this, refreshing the page, you see how the color changes from orange to blue according to our T value, which changes now smoothly according to the sign function. And this is actually how transition works in CSS. Check it out if you're not familiar with it. But now I'm going to teach you how to interpolate sound. So I'm going to go here and define an audio context. And I will define now a function on click. So when we click on the canvas, I'm going to initialize this audio context if it's not initialized. I do this thing because the audio context cannot be initialized unless the user interacts with the page first. So I initialize this in this kind of difficult way where first I try to make it uh, audio context if available, but some browsers don't have this support. So you have to look for it somewhere else. And um, at the moment, this is the nicest way I know how to initialize this object like this. Now, with this audio context initialized, I'm going to define an oscillator. Basically, I want to have a tone at a specific frequency playing. And I will create this oscillator like this, and I will set the frequency to, for example, 200, and start. Now, this will work but I would like to reduce the volume of this oscillator, otherwise it's going to hurt my ears. So I'm going to go here and define 
a gain node. So I do that by calling this create gain function of the audio context and then setting the value of that gain to 10%. I think this is going to be enough. And then I need to connect this oscillator to that node first and the node to the destination of the audio context. If you're not familiar with these and you want to learn more, I do teach about the web audio API in my visual web development course where I make this uh, augmented reality piano, but also in the shorter melody maker tutorial I have online. But yeah, let's save this, refresh, and nothing happens at the moment, but if you click, I have to check it. Yeah, you can hear this tone, this beautiful tone uh, of 200 frequency. Now, I want to change this frequency depending on that T value using interpolation. So I will take this oscillator out here as a global variable. And same what we did with the colors, I'm going to define two frequency values. One for low frequency, I will use this 200 value. And one with high frequency, I will use this 600 value. So it's going to have a higher pitch. And inside of this animate function, after I do the color interpolation somewhere here, I'm going to check if the oscillator is defined. So after we click the canvas, then I'm going to set its frequency value equal to, and now I'm going to use lerp from the low frequency to the high frequency. And I'm using the simple lerp function that we wrote in the beginning, like this. Let me close this, refresh, and now if I click on this, <laughs> yeah. It's a funny sound, I think. It reminds me of the theremin I built during my coding ultramarathon. I'm gonna make a coding tutorial on that soon, if it's not out already. But next, I'm going to show you also how to interpolate text. First, I thought I'd make a counter that changes the text value itself between two ranges. But then I was looking on 3Blue1Brown's channel and I noticed this text animation. And I think we can do it quite easily using interpolation. So let me go down here and write some text to begin with. I will say with the white stroke style and align to center a baseline to the top. This time I want it to be on the top of the screen. And with a relatively large font, let's set it to bold 40 pixels Arial, I will call the stroke text method. And let's have some instructions here for people using this page. Click for sound. Otherwise, they don't know there is also sound here. And I'll put this in the middle of the canvas. So the width divided by two and let's say 10 pixels from the top. So we have some kind of margin. Refresh the page and we see the text there. Now, key to animating that effect is to use the line dash. So I'm going to set here the line dash to 3,3 in an array. And now I have to refresh the page to show you what I'm talking about. And it just makes these uh, strokes forming the shape of the letters into dashed lines where three pixels are used for the dash and three pixels are used for the spacing. And if I don't reset this line dash, it's gonna affect also all the other lines as well, like when drawing this circle right here. So I'm gonna reset this to an empty array like this. And now when I refresh, it only affects the text right here. Now, to get that effect, I'm going to increase this spacing right here to something really large, like maybe 70. Let's see how it looks like. And 
each letter now has just one small line there followed by a lot of spacing. Let's actually use the fill text as well so that we have some kind of a reference here. And uh, we see that this C actually has two lines here and this F has two lines. R has just one line because this spacing value of 70 is not enough to cover the whole letter C here, for example. So let's try a bigger value, like maybe 100. All right, I think this looks good. Some of the letters still have two lines like this O, but that's because it's made of two different shapes. Now, what we want to do is to change this value 3 right here from the size of this line so that it goes from 3 all the way to 100. So let's just write here, lerp between 3 and 100 using the same global t value we had earlier. And when we refresh, we get this. Looks like it's still too short on some of the letters here. Let's try 130. And now it covers all the letters entirely. And you can start off here with any value. Maybe you could start with something like 50 and get a different effect where the letters are already partially written. I think this fill text here is a little bit too strong. So maybe I'm going to set the fill style to RGBA. Let's use alpha as well. And let's make it the white text with a fair amount of transparency, like this. I like how this looks like. Maybe even less transparency, like a 2. Of course, you can control also this transparency using interpolation if you want, but I'll let you experiment with that, because I have to go. Uh, before I go, let me leave you with some uh, music. See you guys.